it, it's, it's this that you're supposed to get right. You know, what the cobordism is that goes between these guys. And you notice that the <coughs> this picture has actually a, a threefold symmetry. So if you take the tetrahedron and draw one picture and you rotate it, the three clicks, you get the, each of the other pictures. So that kind of fixes, and the, you know, the important is the sense, in sense of the rotation. And then um, <coughs> what's interesting is understanding the, uh, um, the composites of these guys. So, so to say, you know, so <coughs> let's define I sharp of K for K and not in the three sphere, I sharp of K is I sharp of S3 and K. And then the, the claim is that there's an exact triangle. I should and um, where these guys are induced by these cobordisms. OK, and that, this exact triangle is you know, exactly analogous to the Havanoff exact triangle. Um, again, there's a difference in convention. So the relationship's not going to be between the Havanoff homology of the knot and Havanoff homology of uh, an instanton homology, but rather with you know, the Havanoff homology of the mirror will be related to the Havanoff homology of the knot. <coughs> or, you know. Or I could decide to take cohomology of something. Or is it Havanov cohomology? Or is it <coughs> Kovanov? Is it Havanov homology? <laughs> or Kovanov cohomology? Or <laughs> anyway, um, you know. OK, great. So um, the interesting thing is understanding how these guys compose. And you know, what, uh, all, I'm, all I'm doing is putting a certain kind of twisted one handle that goes between these guys each time. And it, it turns out to be interesting. Uh, <coughs> let me try and draw. Uh, schematically, what, what um, kind of describes the combinatorics of one of these guys. Um, actually, let me say this is the first one. It was red. Um, and then that one's going to blue. Um, and then um, when I go again, so this uh, th this is supposed to describe how um, you know this is pair of red edges, pair of blue edges, and what the what that band the twisting kind of means that there's this little extra twist in here, um, <coughs> right? This is this is a, a, a one handle attached. You know, if I think of the knot times i, this is attaching a one handle. Um, this is where the core of the one handle attaches, and this is kind of where the co-core attaches. And if I, so this is sort of a, uh, you know, uh, yeah. So uh, I can do this again. Um, <coughs> um, maybe. This last one is green. These guys go in the same sense. So th this, this is what the composite of two of these guys looks like. And the thing to notice that we've 
constructed a, a Mobius band when, when we do that. So that composite cobordism, if I look at, just thinking about the surfaces, if I look at uh, sigma 2, 1 composed with uh, sigma 1, 0, this guy, <coughs> it has, um, you know, a Mobius band has, of course, only one boundary. So I can think of taking it out. Then I have something that has boundary, you know, just a one circle boundary, and I replace it with a disk. So topologically, this thing turns out to be uh, actually, <coughs> um, it, it turns out to be sigma uh, 2, 0 backwards, connect some RP2. Okay, um, I mean, <coughs> you, you got to check that. Um, and uh, let me spend two seconds about RP2s. So this is, a, you know, I've done my first guy. There's a sigma <coughs> two one, sigma one zero. You know, I, I can't draw them much better than that. But then this composite, somehow, there's a an RP two in here, right? and this is happening happening in R times S three. <coughs> now, um, you might complain for a moment, but are non-orientable surfaces okay? Well, that that's the beauty of the particular holonomy that we're looking at. I, the uh, i and minus i are conjugate inside SU2, so it's fine. You know, if I, I don't have to tell you the difference. I don't, I, I don't have to specify the direction in which I take the holonomy. We're looking at connections mod conjugation, so, uh, so it doesn't matter. Um, and so it's non-orientable surfaces are fine for this story. They wouldn't be fine if I had a different holonomy, then I'd have to know which way I'm going. Um, so non-orientable surfaces are okay. And it, it, RP2s, let's think about them in S4. They're, they're already quite interesting. So, uh, so first observation is that non-orientable surfaces uh, have, have a uh, well-defined kind of self-intersection number. <coughs> so you'd think, it, it, you'd think, you know, if you have an orientable surface inside S4, its normal bundle is necessarily trivial, right? The, the normal bundle tells you what the self-intersection number of the surface is, the self-intersection number, when it's orientable, the self-intersection number of, of the surface is necessarily zero because it's homolo homologically trivial. But it's not true for non-orientable surfaces. And um, what you can, it, it, in fact, so what's the definition of the self-intersection number? If I have a non-orientable surface, non-orientable or not, a uh, uh, common definition is that I just, you know, I, I make the surface transverse to itself, it meets at finally many points, then I pick an orientation, local orientation for the surface at each of the intersection points. I use the push-off to orient the other guy. Then I compute that self-intersection number. I mean, count up with sign that number. That's an integer. Of course, if it's orientable, I'm free to choose the same orientation everywhere I did, I, I want to. I mean, everywhere I, I made a choice, I could just pick the orientation that the surface gives me. But if it's non-orientable, it turns out that's well-defined. And um, it can be non-zero even if the surface is null homologous. Um, and, and for example, what am I doing very badly? OK. Um, <coughs> um, yeah. So I say, it? yeah. So. Just to see that there, so I, I'll show you. Here, here are two interesting non-orientable surfaces in uh, S4. So 
it, it's a beautiful fact that was observed by several mathematicians from the, several of the greats from the, uh, uh, um, from the 70s, Arnold, Kuiper, um, Massey, a few other people observed independently that if you take it CP2 mod conjugation, that's actually in a natural way diffeomorphic to S4. You have to be a little bit careful about, you know, be a little careful about that, but anyway, it's a, a model for the four sphere. Um, inside CP2, there are two very different interesting, well, sorry, uh, so there's an obvious interesting RP2, the fixed points at the real points, the real RP2 and CP2. Now the real RP2 and CP2, <coughs> um, well actually it, that's already interesting, it has a non-zero self-intersection number, right? The normal bundle, the, that, that RP2 is Lagrangian, so the normal bundle is isomorphic to the cotangent bundle. The Euler class of the cotangent bundle uh, with twisted coefficients is uh, minus the Euler characteristic of, <coughs> um, of RP2. So uh, the Euler characteristic of RP2 is one, so minus the Euler characteristic is minus one. And now if I push that down, I'm twisting the normal bundle, sort of squaring it. So the real RP2 inside here has self-intersection minus two. Now I'll give you another RP2. I take a real quadratic, R real degree, homogeneous polynomial of degree two with real coefficients that has no real points. That's a two sphere, a conic curve in CP2, which misses RP2. Because it has real coefficients, it's invariant under conjugation. Conjugation is acting by, um, you know, by the antipodal map on that RP2. Upstairs, it has self intersection four. It's a degree two curve, it has self-intersection four. When I push it down, it is self-intersection plus two. So there's an, there's an RP2 plus and an RP2 minus. Uh, so self-intersection plus two and minus two inside here. Okay, and there are a lot, lot, of, lot of fun ways to describe it. Some of them are described in the notes. Um, and yeah, so it turns out that this, this is RP2 plus. Um, <coughs> that, you know, th that's finally the real answer to your question. You, you gotta make sure that it's RP2 plus. You can do this either way. One will give you RP2 minus, one will give you RP2 plus. You better get RP2 plus. Um, and the, the beautiful thing is that um, so now there's a n new game that we can play. Where's my, never mind, eraser. So here's this. Uh, you know, this cobordism, sigma two, one, sigma one, zero, and then I see this, there's this RP2 plus in here. Now, <coughs> what I wanna think about doing is let's take this RP2 plus and kind of exhibit its connect sum geometrically, that it's a connect sum. So what I'm gonna do is think uh, here is the cobordism sigma <coughs> zero two backwards, so it goes from two to zero, um, as, as this one does inside here. That's the surface sigma. And then uh, I wanna, here's S4 containing uh, RP2 plus, and I tube them together. Now, th there's a natural one-parameter family of metrics that goes from this picture to this picture, right? And one of the things that, you know, one of the bits of homological algebra that you teach yourself from thinking about moduli spaces is that whenever you move things in a family, then the map, so these two will induce the same map on homology, but in fact, the 
if you look at the one parameter family of moduli spaces that you look at, that you get from this family, look at its boundary, um, you're constructing, it, uh, look at the one parameter family, count the number of points in it, that gives you a chain homotopy between these guys. So these maps are actually chain homotopic. So, And it turns out that um, if you, w when you study this a little more carefully, you realize that this guy, w when you s pull it off, it has to suck off at some non-zero amount of energy. That's the difference between RP2 plus and minus. That's a computation that you have to do. Um, so this guy sucks off some energy. And what that means is that it doesn't le leave behind enough energy to have a solution here. So this guy, when you stretch out infinitely, is an empty moduli space. So, so the, the chain map is zero when I use this model. It is whatever it is here. It's chain homotopic to this guy, which is zero. So this map is chain homotopic to zero. Right? Mm, that sounds good. So what we've shown is that if you go around here, uh, if you look on homology, each of these composites are zero. Now that, 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 that's, that, that one has a, <coughs> um, so, our, you know, the, I'm gonna say this. The fundamental group of the complement of RP2 minus, or uh, either RP2 is Z2, in one case, the, in, our, in the RP2 plus case, that guy's actually obstructed. In the RP2 minus case, it's not obstructed, and this map is, um, it, it's, the composite in that case would be equal to this map. Okay, but the, I mean, the, the, you know, so if you change all the orientations, which are not the ones we want, this composite turns out to be equal to the composite with the opposite orientation. So, yeah, right. So, the, you know, it's not something that you see, the distinction is not something that you see on the level of, of re representation spaces, et cetera. It's something where you have to think of them as moduli spaces, understand their deformation theory. And, you know, it's not, I mean, as far as it goes, it's, it's not hard stuff, but um, it's stuff. There they are. Okay, great. Um, okay. Now we want to see that there's an exact triangle. <coughs> right, so, so, yeah. So what we just saw is that on the chain level, uh, <coughs> uh, sigma one, two star composed with sigma Chain homotopic to zero. And in fact, let's let's remember the chain homotopy. Give it a name. So that's that's a, a a map from one to zero. Um, and um, sorry. To ah. sorry, I'm doing. I'm going from. I went from two to zero. Two to zero. That's what I meant. Okay, so uh, we want to see if actually we're, we're getting an exact triangle. So, <coughs> um, it's a nice little bit of, uh, of homological algebra that you can figure out eventually. Um, so, abstract situation, sorry, two, one, zero. Uh, and I have, I'm going to call it, well, uh, s sigma, let's call it uh, sigma 2, 1, sigma, uh, I'm just going to index it by the, where it starts. So I, I have chain maps, these guys, 
Um, and what else do I have? Well, this composite is chain homotopic to zero. So there's a map uh, this way. There's a K2 this way. Say, this picture is completely symmetric, so there's a K0 this way and a uh, K1 that way, which are um, the chain homotopies. So uh, you know, if I look at sigma i plus 1 composed with sigma i, sorry, sigma i composed with sigma i minus 1 in this convention. Um, uh, that's equal to um, di ki plus um, um, di plus 1 ki. Everything, everything's mod 2. I'm not worrying about signs here. So I, I have this guy. These are and I want to know if this is an exact triangle. And the, the, the way you can tell um, is there are interesting maps at each of these vertices. So you consider, for example, let, <coughs> let's look at this guy. Um, so what, what can we do? We can do sigma 0 and then k2. And the other thing that we can do is do k0 and sigma 1. And if this is, so consider these guys plus um, cyclic permutations, thinking of the indices as being mod 3. Um, so if this is, so the, the, what you need, so if these are all chain homotopy equivalences. Then that implies that C0 is chain homotopy equivalent uh, to the mapping cone of um, C0 to, to the mapping cone of sigma 2. So plus cyclic, right? So <coughs> um, if you look at everything that you get out of what you just learned, um, you get some interesting new maps to think about. And the thing you have to check is that those new maps are chain homotopy equivalences, OK? Um, <coughs> and then you learn that each of these, you know, that each corner is chain homotopic chain homotopy equivalent to the opposite, the mapping cone of the opposite face, um, which <coughs> you know. Um, anyway, so great. Um, well, fine. Anyway, the, the thing that you actually I draw it. I'm going to draw the picture very schematically to try and indicate what's going on. So here's uh, K2, K1, K0, K2. Um, there's some <coughs> uh, yeah. um, OK, what have I drawn here? If I look at the composite going from k1 to k0, uh, I observe that there's a way of writing it as a connect sum with, uh, with an RP2 in S4. So this. Oh, sorry. It was also a knot a little bit earlier. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
These are knots in the three sphere. I mean, th this, is, this is the three sphere. It has a knot in it somewhere. Another three sphere with a knot in it. There's a surface inside here, uh, surface inside, surface inside here. And what you see is uh, that there's a th another three sphere that splits off an RP2. If I go from here to here, there's another three sphere that splits off an RP2. And um, then what you have to find is that if I go, if I stick these two together, there's yet a third three sphere that uh, doesn't realize it's a little more complicated. It's not uh, a connected sum picture, but what happens is that um, <coughs> um, yeah. <coughs> Um, so, if I look at the composite, uh, sorry, sigma zero two composed with sigma uh, sorry, I'm running out of steam. Sorry, let's go from here. Sorry, I look at k two one composed with k, uh, 0, 1, composed with k, uh, two, 0, 2. You know, whoever didn't use reverse Polish notation should just be eliminated. Um, just anyway, you know, the composites are the opposite direction, whatever. Anyway, <coughs> you look at this composite, so there's this big surface in here. This thing turns out to look like um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a product with, uh, <coughs> with a, this, is kind of, this is a Klein bottle, um, pu twice punctured, which is attached to a cylinder, uh, which is K, uh, R times K2. All right, so this, this big composite, it's, not, it's a little more complicated than a connect sum There's, uh, of surfaces. There are two boundary components when I cut the, with the three sphere. This thing's a Klein bottle. Um, and what you can, um, but this is starting to, to show you where the chain homotopy equivalence, I mean, in this case, it'll be, um, these things will be chain homotopic to the identity, actually. And the identity map is going to come out of this bit. It's a product. And, you know, there's some, anyway, kind of out of time, but there's, some, there's a beautiful way of constructing uh, <coughs> a chain homotopy from uh, the, uh, you know, from these maps to the identity map that's induced by the product cobordism. And that, that's eventually what, what allows you to prove that, um, you know, that there's a, an exact triangle. And then, uh, just to, to say quickly what happens, how you relate it to Havana homology. Well, w once you have one exact triangle, you can it, you take a knot projection, you look at the crossings, you number them, you do make an exact triangle for the first crossing, then you, you, you replace the original instanton complex for that guy by a mapping cone. Then each of the, you get two new knots, which are simpler in the Havanov, I mean, you know, with fewer crossings. You do pick up the next crossing, same one in both of them, replace each of those complexes by mapping cones, et cetera. You get a cube. The cube looks just like the Havanov cube, except that, um, uh, <coughs> um, Yes. So I don't know. Maybe there's a <coughs> uh, k11, k00, etc. There are maps along these edges. That's what Havanov likes. Um, but if you go through this construction and think about it carefully, you find that the instanton guy can give you other maps, which are uh, which follow the descending diagonals in the cube. 
So what you see is the instanton homology, this, there's a huge chain complex with lots and lots of maps in it that computes the instanton homology, but it's, it's filtered by the sort of height inside the cube. I mean, starting from this is the lowest point, that's the highest point, there's a filtration. And what you can check is that if you take, so that gives rise to a, a spectral sequence, and what you can check is that the E1 page, it, which only notices, uh, which takes the homology at each vertex, that'll be homology of instanton homology of the unknot, which or uh, an unlink, which we compute, and then uh, the edge maps are the Havanoff maps, but there are higher differentials. So eventually, you get a spectral sequence. So the instanton homology necessarily has rank. Um, it's, a, its rank is a lower bound for the Havanoff homology, instanton homology detects the unknot. Havanoff homology detects the unknot. There we go. Whew. Yes, Josh. Well, um, you know, I mean, you know, it's it, it's a little tricky because it involves the mu map, the f I mean the point map induced by the point class. So, you know, the, there's sort of a connect sum theorem, but it's just, the connect sum theorem's tricky because it's not just, you know. I mean, you know, just like in floor in in Hagar floor homology. I mean, the connect sum theorem's not the, it's not trivial. There's some, you know, um, you have to take care of the fact that there are operators on each of them which become equal after you take the connected sum. But then I mean, you can do that. Yes, Josh, <laughs> Josh Prime. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a client. Uh, I mean, well, sorry. Uh, I mean, the triple composite's still got a client. It's just the same. Um, <laughs> I mean, <coughs> um, yeah. There's still a Klein bottle there. That doesn't, the orientation doesn't, it's a different, you know. No, but then, then, then it's just a connect sum with, well, now you, if you get rid of the RP2, then you've gotten rid of, you know, you know, 